greatness begins long before you step onto the court. It begins in your mind. It begins on early mornings. It begins when you want to quit. Greatness builds with each step you take. And a successful training program makes sure those steps are taking you in the right direction. of an athlete is the vehicle for achieving greatness. But this vehicle needs to be constantly maintained, repaired and improved. Every time an athlete steps into the ring, onto the court or readies themselves to perform, their bodies take a hit. The physical demands of sport can be huge and the only way to meet these demands is to have an appropriate training program in place. All sports are different, as are all athletes. So training programs must be tailored specifically to the type of sport being played and also to the unique needs of the athlete. This involves many factors, including the athlete's objectives, strengths, weaknesses, age and gender. There are many different kinds of training programs. The one that's appropriate for you depends on the sport you're playing and on you, the athlete. The definition of fitness is the ability to meet the demands of a physical task. It doesn't matter if you're boxing, rowing, playing basketball or involved in any other type of sport. The components of fitness always remain the same. Muscular strength and power Agility, reaction time, balance, coordination, anaerobic power, and speed, muscular, and cardiorespiratory endurance. Strength is the ability to exert a force against a resistance. Strength is an integral component of many sports. From the force required to grip a tennis racket, to the force exerted by the quadriceps and hamstrings in a rugby scrub. We can build strength by increasing the intensity of certain exercise, by increasing the weight or resistance, and by increasing the number of repetitions we do of certain exercises. Two major elements of power are strength and speed. Speed describes how fast you move your muscles and strength describes how strongly you can contract them. Power is extremely important in sports like boxing, football or cricket. Power can be developed through weight and circuit training. Agility describes how quick you are on your feet. It involves the ability to change direction quickly and efficiently. Agility requires balance, speed, coordination and power. Agility helps speed up reaction time. This is the ability to process information via the nervous system and to react quickly. Reaction time is important in sports like sprinting, tennis and hockey, where quick responses have a direct influence on performance. Balance is the skill of maintaining the body's position, either in a stationary position or while in motion. Having good balance means you can adjust your body's position to avoid falling over. Balance requires efficiently coordinating the efforts of our ears, eyes and muscles. Flexibility also plays a major role in most sports. It can play a minor role, such as warming up before an event, or a major role, perhaps being required in the event itself. There are two main types of muscles. 
agonist muscles, also called protagonists, cause movement to take place. And antagonistic muscles oppose the movement and determine the amount of flexibility a muscle has. The goal of flexibility training is to improve the range of those antagonistic muscles that permit the athlete an extended range of motion. Having high local muscle endurance enables the body to perform sustained tasks like rowing or cycling. There's aerobic endurance, anaerobic endurance. These different forms of endurance help the body of an athlete to perform for a longer period of time and have a greater energy output than an untrained body would. Cardiovascular endurance builds the strength of the heart and its ability to deliver blood to the muscles. Cardio helps the body to endure repeated exercise, like running long distances, rowing, or even just staying on your feet. Coordination is the ability to bring all these elements together and have them all work in conjunction with one another. Muscular endurance is needed in sports like basketball, when players are repeatedly jumping up to the backboard and rebounding over and over again. It's important to determine which fitness components to focus on in your training program. This requires you to know two things. The physical demands of the sport and your own level of fitness. You can identify the physical demands of the sport by conducting a games analysis. This can be achieved through movement analyses, work to rest ratios and skill analyses. The use of GPS tracking data and video analysis in recent times has been particularly useful in gathering this information. Standard fitness testing protocols can help you determine your personal level of fitness in each of the components of fitness. Identifying your strengths and weaknesses in comparison with the demands of the sport will allow you to develop an effective and individualized training program. Great athletes grow from working great training programs. Every sport is different. Every athlete is different. And every training program should be tailored to the athlete's specific needs. These differences aside, every training program should address a range of fitness components relevant to the individual requirements, such as muscular strength and power, agility, reaction time, balance, coordination, anaerobic power, and speed, muscular, and cardiorespiratory endurance. In many competitive sports, the game, the race, or the fight is already won or lost long before the athlete steps up to contend. Winning doesn't start on the field. It starts here, in the gym, on those dark early mornings before the rest of the world has woken up. Or late at night, when all you want to do is sleep. In the gym is where the real fight begins. You can train all day and all night, but if the training isn't appropriate to the sport, or for you as an athlete, then all that hard work could be for nothing. There are many different types of training methods, each with various benefits that help the athlete improve a different aspect of their fitness. Finding the one that's right will take some time. Continuous training is a steady and unbroken exercise that builds aerobic and muscular endurance. The most popular form of continuous training is running at a regular pace for a long time. This builds stamina, helping the athlete perform at a higher level for a longer period. Interval training is similar, but focuses more on completing hard repetitions with a brief recovery period between each one. An athlete will run hard for a set length of time that is appropriate for them. After that, they reduce the intensity of the activity by either resting, walking or jogging slowly, before hitting it hard again. The process is then repeated and is focused on building aerobic endurance, 
muscular power, anaerobic power and speed. Fartlek training combines both continuous and interval training. It allows athletes to alter the speeds and time intervals at which they complete running bursts and dictates when they fall back into periods of low intensity continuous activity, such as jogging, and for how long. Circuit training can be tailored in many different ways. It takes into account the training goal and the athlete's level of fitness. It works at improving aerobic endurance, power and speed. The format of circuit training can vary, but it's usually a set of six to ten different exercises like sit-ups, squats, bench lifts, or any other type of exercise that you want to incorporate. Each exercise is performed for a set number of repetitions before the athlete moves on to the next. In circuit training, it is important to have short rest intervals between each exercise and a longer rest between each circuit set. To produce fast, powerful movements, athletes undertake plyometric training. Plyometric exercises work at strengthening the muscles so they can contract at a faster speed and with more power. This helps the athlete to leap higher, hit harder and pull stronger. Weight training builds strength and muscular endurance. It's an exercise based on repetitions, sets and gradually increasing the weight being lifted. There are different types of weight training targeting different sports. For instance, rowing requires a different set of exercises than basketball does. Unlike some of the other training methods, weight training requires equipment such as dumbbells, a weight bench and various other pieces of equipment. Athletes are required to produce bursts of speed over short distances in many different sports. To generate the amount of speed, power and strength required, athletes need to undertake speed training. This requires a combination of strength training, power and sprint practice. Speed training needs to be built up over a period of time. Athletes start off practicing sprints over a reasonable distance and a reasonable amount of time. Then they gradually increase the sets and distance, if appropriate, while maintaining good technique to maximize speed. Pilates is another training method that can be beneficial when used in conjunction with the other techniques we've covered. It works at strengthening the core postural muscles and developing body alignment but it also has many other benefits, such as enabling relaxation, improving coordination, increasing stamina, and aiding stress relief. Pilates exercises help the brain and body to work smarter, not harder. Performance excellence is born in the gym, so having the correct training program is essential. There are different types of programs, such as continuous training, interval training, fartlek training, circuit training, plyometric training, weight training, speed training and Pilates. It's just a matter of finding the combination of methods that's suitable for you. Training requires dedication, it takes commitment, and it takes perseverance. To reach their full potential, an athlete needs to incorporate a few different training principles into their program. An athlete needs to be specific about what aspects of their fitness they want to improve. Then they can work specifically to tune those muscles and hone their skills. It's important that the training is appropriate for the goal. There's no point undertaking weight training if an athlete is trying to improve hand-to-eye coordination. Progressive overload is when an athlete slightly increases their level of training over a period of time. This could mean increasing the amount of reps they perform during the overall program, increasing weight, or increasing the duration of the training. 
The key is to increase in small increments of no more than 10% per week. So, if an athlete jogged for 20 minutes one week, in the following week they could gradually increase that to 22 minutes. The frequency in which training is undertaken depends on the athlete and what their goals are. A professional athlete may train intensively six days a week, while others may not. Training three times a week is a good start to help maintain fitness and improve specific skills. Intensity describes how hard an athlete trains. There's no point hitting the gym a few times a week, but never breaking into a sweat. To see improvements in both skill and fitness, athletes need to push themselves to work harder. But they must be careful to increase the intensity of their training sensibly. Attempting too much too soon could result in injury. When we talk about durations in training programs, we mean either the length of a session or the length of a program. When training, try to keep durations fluid to allow for special circumstances such as carrying an injury or preparing for an upcoming event. Keep in mind that a training program is not set in stone. It should be constantly changing and adapting with the fitness levels, skills and needs of the athlete. Remember to mix it up. Keep it interesting so the athlete doesn't become bored and lose motivation. When trying to build up stamina and endurance, you don't always have to be jogging. You can skip or use an exercise bike. The important thing is that you don't let the program become stale. When designing a training program, specify what aspect of fitness you are aiming to improve. Gradually increase that through progressive overload. Make sure the training is frequent, intense and for a set duration and always allow room for adaptation. No matter what sport it is, we seem to keep score of absolutely everything from the fastest times to how many baskets are scored. We even keep statistics on how many punches are thrown and landed in a boxing match. So it's quite natural for an athlete to set and record goals in their own personal training. It's a key component of a sporting and competitive nature. Setting goals provides a motivational focus. It gives an athlete something to strive for. If the goals are realistic enough, they can lead to feelings of satisfaction, confidence and accomplishment. But if goals are unrealistic, they can have a negative effect and cause stress, anxiety and disappointment. By setting goals, we can also track improvement and over time use that information to evaluate our progress. When we talk about goal setting in sport, we usually refer to two time frames. There are long-term goals, which could span anywhere from one year to four years. These involve preparing for things like winning championships and competing in the Commonwealth or Olympic Games. Then we've got short-term goals. These are the steps that lead to long-term goals. Short-term goals are extremely important. They are the stepping stones that make long-term goals achievable. It would be pretty daunting for an athlete to set a goal of winning gold at the Commonwealth Games if they don't have any steps to lead them there. Whether it's obtaining a gold medal or winning a championship, the principles of goal setting remain the same. A clear and precise method of goal setting is known as the SMARTER principle. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timed, evaluated and recorded. An athlete needs to be specific about the goal they are trying to achieve. You can't just say you want to be a better basketball player. That's too general. There's no clear path leading toward the attainment of that goal. But if you said you want to practice four times a week and work on improving your foul shooting, 
Then you have a specific goal. The athlete's goal also needs to be measurable for two reasons. First, the athlete needs to know when they reach it. And second, they need to be able to measure their progress. You want to skip faster? Set a goal of 100 skips per minute and then try and reach that goal. Once you have, change the goal to 110 per minute. If an athlete's goals can be measured, they are likely to be viewed as more achievable. Not all goals can be achieved straight off the bat. Some will require an athlete to set secondary goals to help them attain their major ones. For instance, if you want to introduce weight training into your program and you don't have any weights, you may have to put some money aside each week to purchase a set. You need to make your goals attainable if they are to be realised. Goals must be realistic to be achieved. They need to be just within the athlete's grasp and must be something the athlete truly believes they can achieve. Only the athlete can decide whether the goal they're striving for is realistic. A goal, any goal, no matter what it is, is probably realistic if an athlete believes they can achieve it. Another aspect of the SMARTER principle involves setting a time limit to achieve goals. Don't say, I want to be able to cycle 50 kilometers in 90 minutes. Say, I want to cycle 50 kilometers in 90 minutes by the end of the year. Setting a time limit will keep the athlete motivated and on track. Without setting time limits, it's likely that our goals will never be achieved. Over time, an athlete's goals will change and evolve. An unexpected opportunity may arise, or they may incur an injury. Goals need to be flexible in order for them to be achieved, and therefore regular evaluation and adaptation is essential. There's no point in trying to stick to a goal of competing in two weeks' time if an athlete has an injury that's going to take six weeks to heal. Athletes should record their goals. They must write them down and reread them. This will lead to a real sense of accomplishment when the goals have been achieved. If an athlete keeps track of their progress on a regular basis, they can see which aspects of their training they can improve on and which ones are on track. A handy way to work toward achieving your goals is to use the SMARTER method. Make sure your training goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timed, evaluated and recorded. To stay on track and achieve any goals you've set, you need a game plan that sets training targets, competition targets, and allows flexibility to accommodate for your progress as an athlete. An annual plan can be divided into three main phases called macro cycles. The preparation or pre-season phase, the competition or in-season phase, and the transition or off-season phase. Each of these phases can be broken down further into mesocycles, which can last from anywhere between two and six weeks, and also week-by-week -week planning, called microcycles. Having this degree of organization in the planning stage of the macrocycle helps an athlete to be ready for the competition phase. Depending on the type of sport being played, the competition phase can incorporate multiple events that comprise a season, or just one major event with a couple of smaller ones leading up to it. Regardless of the type of event, every athlete needs to partake in the transitional or post-competition phase. This phase helps the athlete avoid burning out, allows their body to regenerate and helps them relax mentally. The transitional phase can last from weeks to months, depending on the length of the competition period. As you wind down from one macrocycle and look to another to begin, 
you'll find this is a perfect time for reflection, self-evaluation and analysis. We all judge success in different ways. For some, success could mean beating a personal best. For others, it could mean being the best. How we judge our success depends on the individual. It's important that we take the time to evaluate our progress. This might mean seeking feedback from coaches, judges or teammates. Or watching footage of past competitions to find any weaknesses that could be improved in the following macro cycle. And when you've finished reflecting on the year that was, after you've tracked all your successes, improvements, wins and losses, it's time to set new targets with a whole new set of challenges and a whole new set of goals. To stay on track, athletes need a game plan that outlines all their targets and goals in the various stages of the macro cycle. Evaluating success and progress helps athletes plan for the future. They need to know their strengths and weaknesses before they can work on improving them. Sport isn't about winning or losing. And it isn't just about how you play the game. Sport is about excellence. It's about pushing yourself harder and faster than the other guy. It's about doing the things the others won't. Sporting excellence is primarily a fight against yourself. And it's a fight that starts long before you step into the ring.